Well, happy Culture Cast Day, everybody, and happy first day of Women's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How about that, Karim? And welcome, Karim Giscombe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having me. And hopefully the play on music for Culture Cast also you vibe with. I always like to point it out. I know that you know a common friend of ours, Mike Miller, and his son-in-law actually wrote and produced that little ditty to reflect the energy of the amazing people that I had the chance to converse with on CultureCast. So super excited to have you, Karim. I think everyone can see that Karim is the CEO of Plant, and we're gonna get all up into Plant in a few minutes. But I don't know if you had the chance to read um, my intro to you. I wrote a little intro for you on LinkedIn, Karim. And as you know, for CultureCast, my whole journey is all about meeting leaders who are changing the world and who are creating environments where everyone can thrive. And I think about the role that you and your company plant is playing to literally change food culture in so many ways. And so um, we'll get into plant, which I think people can say, actually, let's just jump into that really quickly. If you can describe in a couple of sentences to those who are not as familiar with your company, what does plant stand for and what is it that you're doing? And then we'll get into why is it that you're doing it? So those are, uh, those are great questions. Um, and I should have known better since I know you that you're going to come in. <laughs> uh, <none of> the <laughs> ramp up time. So it's okay. It's all right. Um, it is Tuesday, I believe. Uh, to answer that question, I've got to break it into two pieces. Uh, okay. what, what does plant stand for? Uh, yeah. You know, plant stands for what I stand for, which is transparency um, in a food system that we are absolutely 100% dependent upon. And at the end of the day, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of gray area. Right. Uh, it's, it's just what it is, though. And again, you know, I've gotten in trouble in the past for uh, for speaking directly on this topic. Um, and I've been coached as, as to how to, to, to moderate that or miter that. Um, that doesn't mean it's worked. Uh, right. Hey, you know, when I when I said in, in 2021 that the system's broken, I meant it. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the perspective is that that. That, that anyone has or where you're coming from. Ultimately, at the end of the day, there are there are simple facts that underpin the statement that's being made. And I'm, I'm more than happy to not only dig into them in, in as granular detail as anyone would care to, um, and it's not so much because of a need to defend them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rather just to speak about what is, uh, because you can't move on to what's next until you understand what is. Totally agree. Pretty yeah. Simple. So... For me, everything about plants is a reflection of my personal journey, um, which didn't start out in any way, shape, or form, you know, with a narrative that would have brought me here. Into well, that. yeah. So let's get into that. I think, first of all, thank you in, in briefly describing, you know, who you are, and it is about creating transparency in kind of the food supply chain, just period, and what it is that you stand for. And most people might think, well, are you a foodie? How did you get here? But I do want to dive into who you are and how you got to this point of actually founding this company and creating this company. So I think it's, at least in getting to know you like three years ago, four years ago, it's not a usual path. And so I'd love for you to kind of start about the, the, the journey for you, Karim, like how did you get started in your career and what led you to creating this company? Um, yeah, here you go again with all the tough questions. <laughs> Not a tough question. No, I don't like talking about this stuff, but it's okay. Um, it's, it's really simple. And I'll give you the, the, the most concise version possible. Uh, yes, nonlinear pathway. Um, I came into food and technology, which is, you know, the nexus of where we exist, um, over dinner. Uh, with a, with a, with an investment opportunity that was at the beginning of a new chapter in my life post corporate America, um, and I'll come back to that and sure. 
I'll go back and give you more color on the corporate world. So I spent, you know, just shy of two decades in finance, starting retail financial advisory and working, working through those channels over a number of years uh, to ultimately find myself for my last four, four and a half years um, working at, in between investment banking and retail wealth management for, you know, one of the largest um, banks slash wirehouses in, in the world, B of A Merrill. Um, and it was one of the best opportunities and best times of my life. Um, but nothing lasts forever. And, yeah. and for me, you know, the, that process of matriculation through, through that, that system um, was, it, it, again, it wasn't something that was planned. It was something that happened. And, and I've, uh, I came to peace with that a very long time ago. And, and honestly, presently in my current state, you know, the, the biggest, I should say, gift that, that, I, that I have or have been given is the ability to come to peace with things, right? For, for yeah. what we are in that moment and simply just accept it and, and move on. So, you know, it is, it's, it's with a lot of pride um, and pain you know, that I yeah. can say that we're, where I am today is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And that's something that I am I'm really happy about. I'm grateful, I should say, even more so than happy about. Uh, despite the fact that I got up today feeling as if I'd been hit by a truck uh, because it's just been, you know, a lot, September was a long month. Uh, I, you know, a good month, great month, especially last week in New York for Climate Week was phenomenal. Um, but yeah, I could use a vacation. Oh my goodness. I don't think you've taken a vacation since you've started this company. And um, it also feels like you had a hard charging in a different way, fast career in corporate America leading up to leading up to this. And one thing I do want to recognize too, and maybe we can unpack this if you want to, is how you are fully present and in exactly the place where you were meant to be. Here you are four and a half years later and coming to peace with that. Um, I love that statement because I think about a couple of years ago, I mean, I myself was going through a transition and had the chance to spend time with you uh, and your wife. You know, my husband and I went out to dinner with you. And I think you have a way of bringing things into perspective. And I think until people can come complete with what they are moving on from and getting clarity on that before they move on to next, this is just kind of the vibe that I'm getting from you right now. But also, and I don't know if I shared this with you, maybe I did, you know, the vibe that I got from you then, like in order to move forward, and you even said this as we're getting into this conversation, um, in order to talk about this vision for the future, you really have to have clarity and closure, I think, with the past. And so um, if you could comment a little bit on this fast track that you were on, I mean, that it's something that just happened. And it's interesting, so a lot of people who are listening to this always feel like, oh, was I destined to be on a path and am I doing the right thing? And sometimes you don't know that you're doing the right thing until you make a decision to move on to something next. And so I'd love for you to kind of talk about that pivot you made. It's like, okay, very successful career, you know, down in the financial district in New York City. And then what made that pivot for you? A multiplicity of things. Um, number one, it was it was time. It was it was if I could put it in, you know, if one word summed it up, it was time. Um, at that specific inflection point, I, I worked for a group that reported into the CEO's office, and our function mm -hmm. was basically trying to develop the communication lines between all the different verticals within the organization, which, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people on here and, and pretty much anyone that works in the corporate environment uh, in the past decade um, has experienced these kind of transformations or transitions that happen. Um, but it was a, you know, Merrill Lynch, the organization I came into, yeah. uh, I have a lot of love for going, going back to, you know, I have family members that, that worked for Merrill well before me, uh, but in the history of the organization, it's so rich and so relevant to when you think about capital markets and what, you know, what our, our capitalist system exists upon, right? There's no way you think about that. You don't think about Merrill Lynch is one of those names that's at the very mm -hmm. top of, of 
that uh, that hierarchy. Um, similarly, you know, Bank of America, albeit um, an organization that was built out of many organizations and, and assimilations over the years uh, to be, you know, I know they're not the largest by deposits, but let's face it, the name is what it is, right? It, it is, is, right. You can't refute it. And, and they are one of the premier organizations. So when you bring both of these together, um, it is nothing but naive to think that that's going to be a simple process, right? Because of just the depth of history on either side of that equation. Sure. And and the thing that we're talking about here, culture, right? Yeah. Culture um, was, was the number one, in my humble opinion, um, asset as well as liability of, of, of that transaction, right? And, you know, some people may not agree with me, um, but I, I, I truly believe it. And when it all came down to it, being in that moment and, and having the opportunity to, to see these two cultures colliding. Yeah. And then, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a unique, having the unique opportunity to, to help form or, or, or corral, you know, all those different swim lanes. Um, the best part of it for me was all the people. Yeah. Right? If you come from the wealth management side of the organization, it's a very different culture than on the banking side of the organization and vice versa. And I was forced to interact with people who I would not have ever done so with and learned a lot, right? Learned a lot about uh, not only those people, not only the, the um, oh, how should I say, the, uh, the underpinnings, the DNA of yeah. that culture, but, but also learned a lot about myself. You know, ultimately, when, when, when it all is said and done, I think the greatest benefit that I got out of standing in that position for those years is the ability to look at myself and understand myself through someone else's eyes. Um, never did that before, right? Wow. Now, working with people that it's different than working with a client, right? You're working with a client. I mean, and, and anyone that's in the sales capacity of any nature understands it, there's a, it's, it's, it's somewhat formulaic, right? Sure. There's things that we have to accomplish, right? From that first initial conversation or outreach. And then there's a process by which you go from, um, you know, stranger to, to client or customer, right? Um, no different in out of home advertising on the bigger, on, on the bigger spectrum, but it's, it's all about messaging and communication. Agreed. When you talk about colleagues or coworkers, it's a different conversation, right? It's especially when you're competing for business mm -hmm. uh, or you're competing for, for wallet share, um, or you're simply competing for time or you're competing for, you know, um, for funding for a business line, right? It, it changes dynamics and you really get a chance to see people. I loved that because of what it gave me. Um, and how it has allowed me to re reshape my thinking around wow. people, around the the role people play in culture and the role culture plays in people. Right. I, I, these are all such good nuggets. I think everyone take a note because I'm going to repeat a few of these things. First of all, I love that you said culture is both an asset and liability. And you think about the two organizations coming together. Um, and by the way, I think that's true for any organization, whether or not you are merging or transforming, blending with another company, culture is everything. And it could be an asset in terms of how you attract, engage, motivate, retain, excite people to be a part of what it is that you're doing. And then that, that they see their purpose attached to the company's purpose, or it could be a liability. And I think about um, the liability really resting and you were in a interesting spot in the office of this reporting to the CEO, helping to merge these together. Cause I've always said this culture is a reflection of leadership and, you know, it could turn into a liability if you're not paying attention to and listening to what the people inside the organization are saying. I think the other thing I heard you say too, 
which I love. I mean, these are such good nuggets that that transformation or that experience that you had allowed you to actually see yourself through the eyes of others. And I think that requires um, some humility and it requires some self-awareness, right? That you're open to actually look at people and hear them for what they have to say. And sometimes it's not, and actually most times it's not easy because we all seem to see ourselves in a certain way. And now here they are saying, here's how I'm experiencing you, but whether it's good or bad, I'm hearing you say that. And then so <laughs> the third thing, which I was immediately gonna say this when you were talking, but you said it already, communication is everything, you know? And I'm hearing you talk about the different um, stakeholders or constituents, whether it's your client then becomes a customer, and then I think as importantly, if not more importantly, the people inside the company. And if you're not creating the kind of care and support engagement with the people inside the company that you are with your clients and your customers, I mean, I can't imagine, right? What kind of culture you're trying to create. And I think I just interrupted you, but those are crazy nuggets that you just dropped in this whole sense of like, creating culture in this pivot that you made coming out of corporate America. I mean, am I getting that right? No, I, I think you yeah. absolutely did. Um, you sound way more uh, eloquent than I do. So thank you for that. Well, I think you dropped those nuggets, my friend. I'm just, free, I'm just repeating them back. Now, one thing I want to say too, I mean, really such a consumer facing organization as Bank of America. I mean, I grew up with it, right? And I think to your point, like I grew up with Security Pacific and the West Coast, and I think eventually became Bank of America. But I can't even imagine these two cultures like, you know, Merrill Lynch. And if you think about um, the top 1% of Americans, you know, and then you think about everybody else, and then those two coming together, you know, I think that is interesting too, hearing you talk about the clash potentially of cultures. And then I, I want to say this and, you know, forgive me if I'm bringing it up, but we also have this immigrant background in common. And I think about your parents, likely your family proud of you because here you are working and living the American dream, working for such a huge brand. And so how did you deal with that? You know, when you decided to make that pivot. Yeah, so we we definitely share that that, yeah. that baseline culture, you know. And I often, with my kids, I um, in the, in the past few years, yeah, my my oldest, my two oldest boys are now in college. The uh, my biggest is um, he's a senior; he's about to graduate this year. I'm proud of him for that. Um, my middle boy is a sophomore. Uh, they're both at University of Florida, um, which is one of the greatest schools in the world. Just shameless plug. I love it. Although I didn't go there. Um, with that said, though, the 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 choices that 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 I made were my choices, and if I didn't make those choices against the wishes of my parents, I wouldn't be where I am today. Uh, that is not to say that. You know, some of these choices haven't taken me down tough pathways, um, but each and every one of those is a, an underlying reason as to why I am what I am today. We, we've all heard it, right? Where some of our experiences, but point I'm making is my parents had an outline or a vision for what they wanted my pathway to be. Sure. And I didn't, I, I did not. And ironically, the hardest thing for me to do, for, the hardest thing I've had to do in the past five years, maybe six, because the minute the conversation about college and pathway started coming up, um, I had a choice to make, which was, was I going to, you know, you've seen the, I think it's the pro progressive commercial. And, um, yeah. The insurance company was like, you know, you, you're, you're, we're, we're here to help you not become your parents. Well, I was yeah. becoming your parents, right? Oh, I, no. I was, I had it in my head, here is, you know, here's what you should do and here's what you should do. Um, not because it's what I wanted, but because of, you know, mine and, and my wife's understanding of who they are, what we've watched them accomplish and, and how they were developing and just, you know, pathways that, that we, we deem to be functional and, uh, and, 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 you know, serve the potential purpose of, of creating a life that they want. 
I had to step back and step really, really, really back. And uh, it was not easy. Uh, and it's still not easy to be candid, right? Um, but but allowing them to make the choices their own. Yeah. And the, only, the only thing I had was to fall back on was the hope that what we had done in the years prior, the culture that we created in, in our home um, would stand the test and, and, and enable them to step out on their own, go through the process of figuring out falter, which is inevitable, um, but at the same time have the willingness, right, to, to see us as a resource and, and engage appropriately. Yeah. Um, but also to find their own legs, right, which going back to that, that, that immigrant culture that you speak about, it, it, there's a lot of value, and this takes nothing away from anyone who is who is not an immigrant, right? Mm-hmm. But there is this unique beauty about the respect that you have for the opportunity that's in front of you. And I say to people all day, every day, there are a lot of beautiful places in the world, but um, there's a reason, right, that anyone from anywhere in the world, in some way, shape, or form, wants to come to America, is in America, or has to. Yeah. America. And it's it's a good thing. So, you know, now not perfect, but a good thing. With that being said, I respected the opportunity and I needed to allow my kids to figure out their own path. That was another one of these, you know, learning moments for me that that have served me really well with them, but more so in other capacities, right? But it comes right back to, and it's funny, right? How Easily, and it's probably because you're really good at the questions that you're asked. Why everything kind of leads all the way back to culture? Yeah, it does. Um, or, or maybe that's just kind of what it is. <laughs> Who knows, right? But direct answer to your question: Yeah, my parents want to be a doctor, a lawyer, and if you're going to go into business, yeah. if you're not, if you're not good enough to be either of those two, then all right, maybe maybe you go into business, and you know that's respectable. Um, and that that's how I ended up choosing business administration as, as, a, as a primary major uh, in finance as secondary. And I didn't like either. I'm, I'm going to be really honest. I yeah. didn't care for either. Why it worked for me is because it, it just did. It worked for me. It, it, yeah. there is, we all have, you know, uh, natural innate skills. Uh, just, you know, it's a part of, our, our individual makeup. Um, if some people are good at one thing and another is good at the other. For me, I think the, the, the combination of my right and left brain, which it's variable. There, there's some days when the, uh, the right brain takes over and the other days when the left brain takes over. Sure. Um, but it, it, it is functionally, I think, what made this work for me because yeah. there is, there's a lot of static in, in, in terms of business processes, right? And to be able to navigate those or to be able to, to evolve or innovate with those or to just not lose your mind, you've got to be able to make it your own, right? You, you've got to be able to make it your own. And this would be a great time if you put in one of the spots, like a little clip from the movie Office Space. Yes. Right, which, you know, why that movie didn't get an Academy Award, I don't know. It I is. love that movie, by the way. It, it should be required. It, required it cracks me up because that is most of what I hear others tell me, what they experience. Office culture today, even office culture 20 years ago, however, that behavior still exists. I'm just cracking up that you're saying that. Anyway. For a reason, right? It is, it is it's one of those things where I think it, it was a beautiful story that, that had a lot there's a lot to peel back, right, in, uh, from that onion. But that being said, the um, making it your own, which was what I did. I, I, I went down the path within the broader path that made the most sense for me, that I, I felt natural in, you know, getting up in the morning, um, going to bed at night. I, I knew exactly what my job was. I, I had ownership of that. And and again, you know, in the early days, being a financial advisor, you're essentially running your own business under the the umbrella of a much larger organization, but you're you're responsible for everything that you develop. 
your client base, your audience. Um, you know, this is, you know, predate I'm dating myself, but this is pre Salesforce, right? Yeah. And, then, and, and pre AI and enhanced Salesforce when, when you had to figure out where you're going today and, and, and how you're going to spend your time. Now, now, now the machine tells you how, where you should go and how you should spend your time and, and tells you how productive you were in that time. Um, but back then, it was something that was comfortable for me. I sure. never had a problem speaking with people, um, you know, really good at math and say I enjoyed it, um, which is why I love asset allocation models and, 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 and all the, uh, the advancements in technology that now underpin our financial system. It's made the job a lot, lot easier, right? Because the real job That's is right. the real job is relationship management. Uh, and that, that for me was something that I naturally, I don't want to say I'm good at, it was, it's a natural fit, right? Oh, yeah. I just talk like this. It, yeah. I'm comfortable. It's something that you love. And actually, oh my gosh, there's so much also for those taking notes that we will highlight. First of all, um, knowing your upbringing and thank you for sharing with the audience again about growing up with an immigrant family and your parents kind of bestowing on you to go pursue this American dream, right? To be a doctor or lawyer or engineer. I'm going to add that in there. And if not, then maybe business. And if business do something, we understand like finance, like that's what I grew up with. And, you know, uh, you and I have that in common. I was a biology major so that someday I can be a doctor. I also love math. Well, I'll say I was good at math, didn't make sure that I loved it, but that all came handy at some point. But I think listening to you talk about your two boys who were now at school at the University of Florida, yes. who one's getting ready to graduate, how liberating it must feel that you have created a culture of learning in your own family. You know, you said at some point that you know, they're going to go and pursue their journey, whatever it is, their passion, whatever it is, and that they may falter, right? But I think what I'm taking from that is how do you create an environment where people feel free that they can learn? And especially early, early days as you're starting your career, now is the time to do that, you know? And so go and test, test and learn before you really jump onto something. And when I think of you, like listening to you, kind of gravitate to what you feel natural towards doing, you're kind of an original millennial and Gen Z, right? So if you think about today, how this generation, and it's the largest population in the workforce, at least in the next five years, it will be millennials and Gen Z. And it is about finding purpose in terms of what they're doing. And hopefully that what they're doing and what their purpose in, is in life they can also see that in the companies that they're going to work for and or the companies that they're going to found on their own. And so um, you're OG in that way. I think about that, that it is about really just owning who you are and what you're passionate about and finding a way to do that. And, um, you know, I can go down this pathway of kids these days, when I say kids these days, in their young 20s, trying to find their way you know, and the corporate America of today is not the same as it was as it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, finding that career path is just not going to happen. And how I think having the um, the grit, you know, to go and figure it out and go found something on your own, I think is pretty, pretty astounding. Um, and so. I love that you said that about your family and how they're going to find their way in going to do this. I know I just went down this weird path, but I'm like, I think that's a cool culture thing too. It's not. I, I, I don't think it's weird at all. Um, you know, well, let's call a spade a spade. <laughs> if 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 you if we're going to have, have a a real dialogue and it's not just you and I, but for anybody who's listening, the, the idea that work and personal life are two separate entities is it's stupid. Yeah. Like it's, it's all right. Maybe I shouldn't say stupid, um, but it had more emphasis, right? So we'll try no, something. 
Yeah. I think that that totally works. It All is. Right. All right. So, so with that, you know, as we talk about, you know, where we were in our, in, in our time and, and where corporate America was and where corporate America is today and where, you know, the present generations entering or who are at the early stages of their careers, um, what's changed? The only thing that's changed is that we have more access to more information and the ability to make more choices but we're not really grounded in how to make those choices. Yeah. That's the big, that's the Delta. That's the problem, right? You again, from, from knowing you, uh, what you know of me, we made our choices knowing full well what the consequences were on, on either side. Right. right? And because we, 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 we grew up in a culture that you had to take ownership of that. Nothing, n- nothing was, easy nothing was taken for granted um now again you know my parents would say you had it way easier you had it easier than i did and their parents would say well you know to them you had it easier than we did that's just the nature of things but yeah that is the nature of how we evolve as a society as a civilization right it's you know we've got creature comforts today that weren't around i remember black and white tv yeah now so it was funny we were in new york the other day and um my uh, my creative director and I were having 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 dinner, and he said, "Let me show you something." And he said, "You see this? This is the hottest thing." And and it was a um, disposable camera, and proceeded to tell me a story about an event that he was at earlier the following week, where all the uh, you know the audience. Gen Zers, everyone was using disposable cameras, um, not their phones. And like, what are you talking about? And he proceeded to explain to me this dynamic shift that's happening where the effort to disconnect mm-hmm. has become the thing, the, the cool thing, right? So, so now what was the highlight of technological innovation for us at one point in time? Here we are some 30, it's probably 30 something years um, later. Yeah. Now we're coming back around and here is the most connected generation of all that has access to everything, real time, wanting something that allows them to have a more unique and personal experience. That I, is- I love that, that you're saying that the disposable camera was the hottest thing. It reminds me of Michael and I were just in New York this weekend at our friend's daughter's bat mitzvah. And the hottest thing to play with was the Polaroid camera. (laughs) So that's what the kids were playing with and now they were taking pictures, not with their phones. It was just playing around with that. And I think you're onto something. It is about, there's this disconnecting from technology in order to to connect to humans, right? And that the disposable camera and the process of that, right? Taking a picture, is that right or not? You've got to develop it to see if it turns out and then share that with others. And I'm going to go connect that to something you also said, you know, this conversation leading up to this, where as you were thinking about your own career in corporate America was really all about relationships, right? And I think the one thing to learn and, you know, um, spoiler alert, for anyone starting their career now in their 20s, and I always say this in every mentor session, every panel that I've been a part of, at the end of the day, it is about those human connections. It is about the relationships, the communication that you're creating with your peers, with the team that you support, the leaders that you work with. That, I think, is going to make the big difference between where you are today and where you want to be times whatever technical knowledge you bring along with you. And so to your point, I think it's just going back to these human skills that um, I think we've forgotten in culture today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And let me, let me kind of track back, so yeah. just connecting that dot. As it relates to what has changed and, and how things haven't changed, but why I highlighted the fact that you know this generation has access, unlimited access to more information than, than we ever have. Um, the, 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 what's beneath all of that, 
how 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 to filter that information, not mm-hmm. you know picture filter. Uh, but again, use that as a as a baseline. You know, taking a picture with a, a disposable camera, to your point, is a very different experience than taking it on your phone. You know, Joe Coy, a comedian, has yeah. A- well, have you seen him. his most recent special? He he went off on this, and I thought it was hilarious too. But that being said, is it's the the art of taking the picture, not dissimilar to the art of thinking, the art oh. of critical thought, right? Yeah, I just stepped into that one, and I'm. I love that all these wisdom and nuggets that you are dropping right now. The art of critical thinking. And if you translate that to taking a picture of the disposable camera and what that really means. Amazing. So, so if we're going to look at how to, how to navigate through corporate environments, you know, go back to how you navigated through high school. Go back to the, the, the conversations at the dinner or breakfast table or breakfast nook in your home or, or the lack thereof, right? Yeah. But back to relationships is these things have been developed as a part of the culture that you're in, which is, again, as we, we, we uh, leaned into earlier, that culture is omnipresent. That's right. And it's going to drive every decision that you make on a go forward basis. And there will be, there will be ruptures, right? At different times that, you know, will, will shift a, a, a viewpoint or a perspective, which is a function, a functional component of your cultural, um, you know, uh, DNA, right? Those changes, you come out on the other side, somewhat different, somewhat altered. But at the end of the day, it's still the same underlying individual. And, and I argue, you know, the work that needed to be done or was done in, in those formative development years, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not, right? Those are the things that lead to the decisions that we make, you know, in our early 20s and 30s. Those are the things that lead to the perceptions that we have going into our 20s and through our 20s into our 30s. And and guess what? Spoiler alert. Yeah. It all changes, right? right. <laughs> it's going to change whether you get it or not. And I've seen you, we've, if you make it to 40, no, and anyone who makes it to 40 that disagrees with me, I will, absolutely <laughs> love it. I will take that conversation any given day. Um, you know, I'll even pay for the drinks, but nice. I'd love that one. Oh my goodness. I totally agree with you. I think people always go, you know, how did you end up in HR? Did you know you were meant to do that? And I, I kind of look back and it is about my culture, my DNA, my upbringing. And I think about two things, you know, the social aspect of in high school was involved in everything, ran track, cross country. I was a cheerleader. I was in student government. I joined every club. And I also was forced to study really hard and get good grades because my parents wanted me to go to college, right? So there's that piece. But then I also think about watching my mom bring over every one of her sisters from the Philippines, sponsoring them, coming over here, them living with us and leaving their families behind. And what they were professionals where they came from. And then here in the US, you know, the only and first opportunities they would get were at these retail and fast food minimum wage jobs. And so not a surprise that if I look back on having been a chief people, whatever, right? Chief HR, you think about these multiple brands that I've been a part of that have a huge frontline workforce that I've had the chance to serve over a million frontline employees in my career. And it is about creating that pathway to opportunity. If I think about the social aspect of it, you know, from a high school standpoint, but then personally experiencing that growing up and then also ensuring that this workforce in front of you similarly finds a pathway for themselves. You know, I saw, you know, I saw my family succeed, right? Like, and they started somewhere and then it was a stepping stone to something else. So I totally agree with you. And unfortunately I would have to buy you drinks, you know, back in the day when I turned 40, because things do change as well. So I get it, but I I do want to jump into, I know a lot of people who are, 
foodies who are um, change makers in their own realm are very interested in hearing about plant. And I remember when I first met you and we were talking about, you know, you starting this company and, you know, I know you, there's been a lot of articles written about you and about plant being the first fully transparent field to plate supply chain in which consumers can track the journey of a vegetable that you're buying. And I remember you said this to me, you said, Marisa, imagine bringing your phone to a Whole Foods, scanning your, you know, scanning that head of lettuce that you're buying and knowing exactly where it came from and when. So um, correct me if I'm if I'm still remembering that right or wrong. And then on. there's been a lot more that has happened since then. I think the last time I physically saw you was a couple of years ago and you were talking about these hydroponic plants that you were getting ready to build. And I think it was not even building yet. You were finding the land to do that. And then a huge announcement that went out last summer. So I'd love for you to talk about, all right, what is plant now? How is it evolving? You know, there's the technology side of it, which I was just mind blown by when we talked about it. So talk about the tech side of it from a tracking standpoint, but then bringing the food closer to the consumers through yeah. these plants that you're building. I'd love to hear all about that. And so would the audience. So it's uh, a lot to unpack and I'll yeah. try to make sure I answer all these pieces. Keep me yeah. up if, uh, if, I, if I gloss over anything. Um, let's start with, we're, we're a data company, right? And I, I don't think I spoke to that at the very beginning, okay. uh, talking about what I stood for and what Plan is actually doing. Um, but providing transparency in the food system is, is a function of data. There is, there is hard infrastructure, there is soft infrastructure, digital infrastructure, however you want to look at it. The, uh, the, the very essence of what we're doing right now, not the essence, but the fact function of us being here streaming is because you know, there is a, there's a, there's a digital infrastructure out there that's been built over a number of years that is now going through a, a rapid expansion as we we uh, we barrel fully forward into the new, you know, the new expanse known as AI. Uh, and again, I don't say that in a tongue-in-cheek way. I sure, I love AI. I think there's a lot about AI that is phenomenal and, and is a great utility for us. But you know, I, I must say that I stand on the side where AI, without checks and balances, is not something that I personally think is uh, you know the best approach. Let's just say that. Um, but as I said, we are a data company first and okay. everything we do requires that, that hard infrastructure, which is our, our glass houses, right? Which, which is our, our cloud systems to be able to transmit the data that is derived or, or aggregated from what we're doing in those glass houses. Um, so first and foremost, plant is a data company. What we do with that data is provide a service to you as a consumer ultimately. The beauty of that for me is in order to enable that 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 dynamic that you just spoke about, where you yeah. can walk in and not just at a, a you know a retail outlet, but at a restaurant. You know, in in 2020, uh, a colleague of mine at IBM, a very senior individual who we were working with as a part of the development team, uh, said to me, "Actually, this is 2019." We we were having a conversation and he said, I have, um, I have, I have something I want to bring up to you. I have, uh, I have a concern, uh, that I, you know, may, maybe I'm just thinking too hard about it, or, you know, maybe it's something that you should think about more. And I said, sure, by all means, I'm, I'm open to it. Talk to me. Um, we were having drinks, so it's a lot more easy to be open. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, he says to me, I think it's a really up, big uphill battle. To, to ask consumers to scan an item uh, at point of sale. And this is in 2019. Exactly. The look in your <laughs> eye, you know exactly. <laughs> what are you talking about? Exactly. That's what everyone wants. Everyone wants to know. Everyone wanted to know. And, and, yeah. and again, IBM had treasure troves of data from, from research and, you know, and, and just stuff they had aggregated over the time. IBM Consulting, that is. And... So he knew what consumers wanted, but but what he was grappling with was, 
we can say what we want. Every New Year's, every, every New Year's Eve, everyone makes resolutions in terms of what we want. And then January 1st through February 30th, 28th is when you see just how badly you really wanted it because you yeah. got to stick in and put that work in, right? So I respected and appreciated what he was saying. Um, and I said, we're clear and we are prepared to put that work in uh, because we believe that there, there is a dynamic where there is enough of an audience within the, consume, the broad consumer base, not just domestically, but globally, that has already demonstrated to us unequivocally that they want access to this information. And if what we're doing is providing you a pathway to that information through a process that may be slightly different than what you're accustomed to, yeah. you know, my argument is, I'd like to see a show of hands of everyone who had a BlackBerry in, in 2004 and wants to go back to their BlackBerry, right? And I remember that feeling as, as a lot of people did, well, where's the keyboard? Where's the keyboard? Yeah. It, it sounds so like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Who, what was a keyboard, right? So my argument was, we, we will get there. We know, we know it's, it, it's a challenge, but again, you know, and I reminded him, our engagement with our audiences isn't about advertising. It isn't about, you know, messaging in the traditional way, right? It's a it's a conversation, and that's something you've heard me say this. Yeah, uh, I say it all day long. I'm always open to a conversation, right? Doesn't mean that you know I'm going to learn something, right? I may learn that I don't ever want to have this conversation again, or I may learn something valuable uh, that is valuable. I may learn something that is accretive and utilitarian to me on a go forward basis from a conversation. That being said, open to the conversation and wanting to have the US consumer, global consumers engage in that conversation, we believe and still believe is, you know, our secret sauce. We're not here to tell or advertise or pitch you on anything. We're providing you a choice. And for you to determine if you wanna make that choice, you know, engage in the conversation. So that's 2019. We agreed to disagree on it. Then comes COVID-19 in 2020, which you yeah. knew where I was going with this. And somewhere around, I want to say, I don't know, September of, of, of 2020, we were, we were in Atlanta together. And I, and I said to him, hey, you know this whole thing about uh, scanning? You realize you just scanned your menu at this restaurant and it took him right back. And I've been waiting for months. Uh, for this thing. <laughs> I, have a, I have a difficult time forgetting. <laughs> so when I said it, like it, it all went off in his head and he just looked at me and he went, hmm. and I said, we're good. And he goes, yeah. We're good. Now disclaimer, I had nothing to do with COVID-19. Uh, right. been, I've been accused of it. No way, shape, or form, right? It just, it just happened. But it, it created that opportunity that we would have had to shoulder the burden and responsibility of which, as I said, we were more than prepared to do that. Um, and it was a spend that it's a real spend, right? Asking the consumer to change your viewpoint, perspective on something, is no no different than asking you know your child, spouse, or a friend, right? Teams, you know, some people. If you're a Jets fan or an Eagles fan, whatever the case may be. Um, so to get to the consumer and provide that information, we have we we literally have to rewire the way the supply chain itself yes. works for each and every one of those products. Right. And so I use the word very specifically wire, because we're talking about the data. But you know, there's duality to that. It's not just the physical wiring because it's not actually wired. This stuff is all done in, in cloud storage. Um, but I say that is there's so many aspects of the way business is done in food, not mm -hmm. just produce, but in food in general that could absolutely stand to evolve. And And I don't think that I'm doing any disservice to anyone in the industry, irrespective of what your category is, in saying that. Because let's let's think about it. You, you go into grocery stores, retail outlets, uh, or restaurants. What a menu or the offerings on these shelves look like today 
yeah, some of them have been there for decades. Yeah. Right? Um, but the packaging looks different. Sure. Right? The, the ingredients may be somewhat different, right? There are different variations of those products. There's evolution. It's, con it's constantly happening. So to someone, for someone to say everything's fine, to me, that's a, it's, it's, it's boring, right? It, it's, it's just, it's boring. It is, right. you can't get to better if you just accept what is, right? We, we both love eating. I can't tell you, you know, how many phenomenal restaurants I've eaten at in my life. The best part is the look, looking forward to the next one and, and the experience that the yeah. next one will present. And by the way, I had a couple while I was in New York last week that I will talk about offline that okay. you've probably already been to, but 100% worth the experience. Oh, um, yeah, right. So as, as chefs, you know, try to bring these experiences to us. It's not, it's no, it's no way different than when, when a QSR or a large, you know, retailer, they, they're, everyone's all, always constantly striving to, to bring new innovative products that, that, that align with their understanding of what their audience is looking for. Can't fault anyone for that. And that's why I say the idea that there is ever a time when how we produce distribute yeah. and consume food of any sort is okay as it is. And we shouldn't look for ways or shouldn't look for opportunities to innovate. I mean, come on, you know what? I don't know what year the cool red, cool ranch, uh, Dorito chip was introduced, but I'm sure they didn't start there. Right. Right. Uh, the double stuffed Oreo was originally the Oreo, right? right. It's, it's they, you know, yeah. And then, and then my favorite is, is when you look at, alternative milks and wow. and dairy milk it, it blows my mind blows my mind and that that marisa may have been one of the uh the tipping points for me that just said yep yeah, just we're gonna kick the door down and just keep going just like they did yeah because you see on the other side of it what that not only has done you know for you know, the company behind it, but all the other companies that have come along. But I would argue that if it weren't for brands like Oatly pushing, right, pushing, kicking down the wall and, 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 and being put up against the wall as a result of it in order to just bring something new into the environment, we wouldn't have brands like Impossible Meat and, right. you know, and, and, and everything else that's helping us as a society to evolve. Now, everyone has their opinions and I'm not saying anyone's right or wrong. What I am saying is anyone that says we're good or this is the how we do it or this is the way it's been and, and let's just stick with that. that no, that's I, I don't believe it. I mean, I nerded out a little bit in preparation for our conversation and I looked at data around how America is getting sick based on the food that we're eating and how the study, the most recent study by the CDC said that like our food across America is causing 9 million illnesses. And they did this, they looked at data from 4,600 outbreaks and, and said that nearly half of those outbreaks or that foodborne illness was attributed to leafy vegetables. Oh, yes. And the reason I share that to you, I share that with you because of what you're doing to change the system you know, to ensure that that doesn't happen and that you're just changing the experience and the culture of food, again, food, food growth, supply chain, et cetera. So I, I just busted out that crazy data and I'm like, oh, I want to talk to him about this. So how are you, how is Plant helping to mitigate that? How are we helping to make, how are you helping Americans be healthier? Yeah, so loaded question. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure I'm sure uh, someone from our legal team is watching to hear how I respond to this. Don't worry, I can hear you guys in my ear. Um, let's go back to you. You keep referencing food, and I'm glad that you're doing that. Um, really, I'm truly appreciative of it, because what I what I don't 
appreciate or frustrates me, I should say more so than not appreciated is when we are relegated to talking about fruit and vegetables, right? Which is just mm -hmm. one category. In food. It is one category, right. What I keep referencing food and keep speaking about in that capacity is the things that are relevant to what we're doing in fresh produce, fruit and, fruit and vegetables, specialty fresh produce, apply to every food category. Yes. Right? E even something as simple as water. With that said, you know, I go back to we're rewiring the food system as it relates to data flow, which requires us to rewire operational dynamics and supply chains to support mm -hmm. the, the product delivery, right? Yeah. Much like when um, smartphones were introduced and carriers needed greater bandwidth, at which that's never stopped slowing down. Right. I read a, an interesting article this morning about that same issue with regards to the massive amounts of data that are flowing over our waves and the cost of that and, and, and you know, the disparity between the, 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 uh, the telecommunications companies and, you know, some of the people that are transmitting all this data. Different conversation. But at the end of the day, it is a process that they are inextricably tied together. So for us, I can't ask them. We would have been just stupid to ask. Anyone, any any supplier, any distributor, any you know retail outlet that we do business with, um, to look differently at the way they are navigating their processes without being able to show them a better pathway. Mm -hmm. And this pathway starts, as I said earlier, with what we do operationally in our greenhouse environment, right? So, for those who don't know, I'll give a very very brief. Greenhouse 101. It's a building. Yeah. It's a glass building, and there are plastic versions of this building the, um, that is semi closed. It's not completely closed off. But what it does is it allows you to modulate all the dynamics of the environment inside that building, mitigate any kind of out, out you know, external airborne yeah. pathogen, um, and limit the resources that you need, mainly water, second soil in order to be able to do the same thing that requires significantly greater acreage, significantly greater, um, you know, depletion of, of the natural resources like water that we spoke about in order to get to that same end, end result of here is a box or bucket of, of, of tomatoes. Um, here is a box or, or, um, or clamshell of lettuce, um, or here is a, you know, Michelin starred meal at, 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 I can't say the name of the restaurant because it's, of course. Right. but, but, you know, when that first course comes out and this, this, this beautiful piece of lobster, um, in this, 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 this foam emulsion that surrounds it is sitting on a, uh, on a bed decorated or garnished with micro greens and, and, and unbelievable, you know, sliced tomato, uh, um, honey tomatoes, you don't get there without that process. And, and let me tell you how I know that is I ask the question all the time, not just, you know, to other people, where do your food comes from? But when I eat, I ask the question of the people serving me, where does this come from? I don't care what it says on the menu. Sure. I don't care if it's written on the chalkboard. I ask, I especially don't like it if it's written on the chalkboard. I'm going to leave that at that for now. Um, but most people can't give me the answer. Lately, the better, the higher the quality or stature of, of dining establishment that I'm at, when I ask that question, especially about a tomato, um, I know where those tomatoes are coming from. Not necessarily the exact location, yeah. but the kind of facility. And that says a lot, right? Which is the, that shift is, is, is happening and it's, it's accelerating. Um, and we're happy about that because it's what we are advocating for for a lot of reasons, not just, you know, from a pure business perspective. Remember, my sure. my, my old tagline on, on, on LinkedIn was reformed capitalist. I, I may have dropped that, but it's still who I am, right? I'm, I, I, I will not pretend that, uh, that what I do, I'm doing from an altruistic perspective. And not, not at all. I want to be really clear about that. Yeah. Where, where my piece comes from is I can do both in one shot. Right. Right both in one shot and it allows me to keep that balance 
Um, and it's, a, it's an in, internal checks and balance system, which is here's what I truly believe in and what I want to see happen. And here's the extent to which that I, I'm going to go to do that. And our investors and our audiences believe in that and support it. And they're seeing the results of that. If they weren't, we wouldn't be able to make the progress that we have so far to where we're about to go, you know, in the next couple of months. And, and more excitingly, what's going to drop uh, Thanksgiving of 2025. Oh, my gosh. We have to revisit this conversation then after Thanksgiving of 2025 just to continue on this journey. So much has really evolved since the first time we had the chance to talk about plant a couple of years ago and where you are now. And I guess I just want to highlight and thank you for reminding me that you're on this mission to really create true transparency on the food system that's happening, not only in the US, but hopefully globally, right? That that will translate to what's happening globally from a transparency standpoint. And I also love that you reminded me too that, you know, first and foremost, you're a data company. And that in doing so, in creating this transparency, it is about how you rewire, you know, the food distribution supply chain system. And you're proving that with what you're doing at Plant, you know, not only through the technology, but also the way I see it, an outsider looking in, you know, creating these environments where you are raising certain food, in this case, vegetables. And... and and Shop. fruits, yeah, yes. vegetables and fruits, and then really utilizing that um, rewiring and that data to follow that journey so that people can experience it and then apply that to any type of food category that you can think about in the future. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, uh, I'm, proud of, I'm proud of that, but more so I'm proud of the people on the team that, that have helped to build that right in, in this decade long journey to the to uh to the starting line as as i like to call it um a lot of people thought i was crazy and i think now more people think i'm crazy and that i actually appreciate i think it's even better right I, on it's way more fun way more <laughs> right, fun, right? Um, and you've got some badass team like smart team members who have yeah. helped you on this journey i think it's amazing absolutely um, I'm realizing we're at the top of the hour and I always, I know we talked a lot about personal culture, company culture, corporate culture, the culture of food transparency. But I do want to wrap with, I always love doing something fun, which is pop culture. And I know you want to talk about this in a different way the last time, but in terms of pop culture and things that you are loving these days, when I say that, whether it's you're eating it, reading it, watching it, you know, wearing it, what is your jam these days? Yeah. Um, time is a, is a scarcity. Um, when I do find that time, it's often in unusual pockets when I'm when I'm on my bike, which not the best time because you need to be more alert. Um, sometimes, you know, in travel because Wi-Fi never works properly on on, on different flights. That's right. Uh, and and also to drown out everything else that's going on around. So when I can, I, I listen I listen to music, and it's normally music that brings me to a place, and it's 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 wherever that needs to take me. I, I came across uh, a channel on, on YouTube, I don't know, probably December, November of last year, uh, and it's called CIRCLE, C-R-C-L-E, an accent oh, on it. Okay. Them, they, uh, they put on some of the most unbelievable um, performances, um, just often from artists that I've never heard of, but it is... It's where music, I believe, what they do transcends music and 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 it's visceral because what wow. they, they blend visual delivery um and a lot and 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 obviously the music itself and location. So you're getting 
you're, you're getting experiences that would not naturally come together. Um, and it, it's been my most welcomed uh, companion, you know, for the, the better part of the past year. Oh. Um, whenever, whenever I, I, I click play, that's normally what I put on and I have yet to come across anything, anything. I love yeah. that. So yeah. it's YouTube, C-R-C-L-E. C-R-C-L-E. Okay, C-R-C-L-E. Yeah. And we'll put that in the notes uh, in case people want to find that. And it, it feels like it's a good kind of like mind cleanse for you. Yes. In terms of like, and, and also brings you joy. This is what I'm hearing you describe it. That's amazing. And Absolutely. how could you make sure I spell it properly? And it is C E R C L E. C E R C L E. And then how can people find you? What's the best way to reach you and or your team at Plant? Um through our, you know, through our email. Uh, I, you know what? I'm I'm an open person and I, I don't have anyone to hide from. So if if you have my number, uh, feel free to use it. If you have my email. Feel free to use it. Um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Oh, right on. But I'm I, I don't I don't have a lot to say. I'm, I'm not that guy. Um, on the other hand, if there's a conversation, I'm always open. I know. What do you mean you don't have a lot to say? I have so enjoyed the time that you've invested, and I know you've got not a lot of it in our conversation today in creating culture, both personal culture, company culture the culture of an industry and just of consumers. And so I just want to thank you, Karim, and also thank everybody who's listening. There's going to be so many crazy learnings and nuggets that I know we're all going to take away from. And with that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Karim. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. Well, hopefully we will see all these notes um, as we post this onto every channel for CultureCast, whether it's on Apple, YouTube, Spotify, or even here on LinkedIn. And then we'll see you the next time on my next CultureCast. Take care, everybody. One more. Bye.